G'day girls, uh, welcome back, um, welcome to Year 11 Chemistry. This is just a short video, hopefully, um, that will cover off what we looked at last year in Year 10 Chemistry, just to sort of get your minds going and just to remember um, some of the key concepts. So first thing we looked at was at atomic structure. So as you would recall, all matters made up of atoms. Um, atoms are made up of three subatomic particles, so you've got your protons, neutrons and electrons. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom. Electrons are in shells around that nucleus. Um, they also have charges associated with them. So a proton has a positive charge and we associate a plus one charge with that. Neutrons are neutral or zero and electrons have a negative or a negative one charge. And that sort of positive and negative charge is what holds you all of them um, together. Um, for each atom, basically, we can get some key information for it. So atoms that um, have the same number of protons, or that are the same, are called an element. And for each element uh, on the periodic table, there's basic information that we can get. So the atomic number can be found on the periodic table. Your atomic mass can be found on the periodic table. Your atomic number tells you how many protons are in the nucleus of an atom. Your atomic mass tells you the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Uh, you'll see on the periodic table that um, your atomic mass is a decimal, but that's the um, relative atomic mass. When we talk about an atomic mass in terms of finding the number of neutrons, it will always be a whole number, okay? Because we can't have, for instance, in this case, we can't have 0.01 of a neutron. It just doesn't happen. There are also isotopes, which is where we have this um, two atoms that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. Um, so for instance, carbon-12 and carbon-14. Carbon-12 would have six neutrons, carbon-14 would have eight neutrons. But they'd both have six protons, making them both carbon. Um, we also have charged um, atoms, which are called ions. Um, cations are positively charged, they lose electrons. Anions are negatively charged, they gain electrons. We then went on and had a look at electron configuration. So how are the electrons arranged in those shells around the nucleus? Um, we had a look at major electron configuration, which was for the first 20, that 2882, or if you're looking at it generally, it's that 281832. So for instance, if something had um, 13 electrons, it would have an electron configuration of 283. Okay, so we're filling from that inner shell out. Subshell configuration was just an expansion on that. Um, that was 1s2, 2s2, etc. So again, if we were looking at that one with 13 electrons, we'd have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. All right. Um, so we had a look at those. We then went on and had a look at periodic trends. So a bit of a brief overview of these. Um, Atomic radius, so as you're going left to right across a period, um, your atomic radius decreases, so they get smaller, there's more protons, there's more uh, charge, uh, positive charge, so that draws those valence electrons in closer. As you go down a group, you've got more electron shells, so your um, radius increases and your atoms get bigger. Uh, we then looked at reactivity. Now, reactivity, you had to separate out your metals and non-metals. So if you have a look here, you've got your um, metalloid uh, staircase. So basically that separates your metals over to the left, except for hydrogen, of course, non-metals to the right. In terms of reactivity for metals, your metals further to the left and further down a group are more reactive. This is because they find it, or they lose their electrons more easily. The reason once the left lose it is because they've got less protons, so there's less charge holding in those valence electrons. The reason down the group, there's more shells, valence electrons are further from the core or from the nucleus, so they can be lost more easily. And then that just swaps for non-metals. So here you've got your uh, noble gases, they're non-reactive, so we only really look at these ones, okay, and hydrogen, um, but hydrogen is a source, it's off here anyway. Um, but if we're looking at them, as we go from 
uh, left to right, the reactivity will increase. As we go up a group, the reactivity will increase, and that's because these ones find it easier to gain electrons. Okay, so less um, electron shells, there's more force on the valence electrons, so those ones higher up a group will draw it in more, further across to the left. Um, there's more protons, so there's more charge, so they can accept or gain electrons more easily. Again, they're non-reactive. We then had a look at the periodic table overall and a couple of key things. So, uh, group one were your alkali metals, group two were your alkali earth metals. We had a look at your halogens in group seven, your um, noble gases in group eight. There were some properties that we looked at, hopefully you've still got your property sheets. A couple of key things that I want you to be able to do though, looking at this you should be able to figure out um, the number of valence electrons for each um, group. So group one's one valence electron, two's two valence electrons. We jump over and that's group three, so three valence, four valence, five valence, etc. You should be able to also remember that you can get your charges for your ions off of this. So for instance, group one's plus one, group two's plus two, your metals here, so plus three, plus four. Your non-metals, zero charge, okay, so they're neutral, minus one, minus two, minus three. Okay, so you should be able to pick those um, charges for your ions off there as well. Then went on and looked at rate of reactions. So um, a reaction requires collisions at specific um, orientations and the correct energy to be able to occur. And there's certain factors that can impact um, the rate of reaction. So speed it up, slow it down. Temperature can increase it, okay? Increase uh, the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy of the particles that move around faster and you're gonna get more frequent um, collisions at the correct orientation and correct energy. Concentration, more particles are present. So again, you're gonna get more frequent collisions at the correct orientation, correct energy, and surface area you're basically getting a solid and you're grinding it up and exposing more of that reactant. So what that does is if you're exposing more reactant, you're going to get more collisions because there's more reactant basically to react with. Um, catalyst. Catalyst was a different one. A catalyst is a chemical that we add to a reaction. It doesn't actually, uh, or isn't chemically involved in it, but what it does is it facilitates the reaction by reducing the activation energy or by facilitating um, collisions. And once it finishes it with uh, particular reactants, it goes on and then works on others until the reaction is finished. Um, an example of that is something like chlorophyll, which is involved in um, photosynthesis. We then have a look at energy in reactions. So we talked about exothermic and endothermic reactions. Um, in an exothermic, your reactants have a higher um, energy then the products, so that energy gets released and it um, feels like something's heating up. Um, example of that is like those instant heat packs that you take on camp where you can squash them and you can have them in your hand and keep them, keep them nice and warm. Um, endothermic is the opposite, so your products have higher energy than your reactants, so it gets absorbed. So an example of that's like a cold pack. Okay, one of those instant cold packs that you might have at um, sport where again you burst that thing inside of it and the energy gets absorbed from the environment so it gets really cold really quick. We then went on to bonding, so we talked about metallic, ionic and covalent bonding. For metallic we really just talked about the fact that it is a lattice but it's got delocalized electrons and these delocalized electrons allow certain properties of your metal, so that's what allows things like electron, uh, the conduct electricity, um, to conduct heat, to uh, gives it that luster, um, it allows it to be malleable, it allows it to be ductile, and if you can't remember what those words mean, maybe have a look on uh, at your notes or Google them. We have a look at um, ionic structures, so an ionic structure is between a cation and an anion in a set ratio, um, they form a lattice. And basically all of the electrons are accounted for it, so they're very, very strong bonds. Uh, in the case of ionic substances, the cations lose electrons and the anions accept them um, into their structure, and that's what gives them the charge. Okay? Uh, we want to be able to find our formulas for these, so if you remember, we had our crossover method we looked at, which is where we take 
the number of the charge for each of the um, ions. We bring them down underneath the opposite one. So in this case, we're going to bring one from the OH down under the CA, and we're going to bring the two from the CA down under the OH. It gives me a formula, CA, and because OH is a diatomic um, ion, we put it in brackets and we put the number of it outside. Okay. We then have a look at covalent. So these were our discrete molecules. It's where those electrons are shared. And we also have a look at drawing them. So if you remember, we drew in the valence electrons, not all of the electrons, just the valence ones. We joined them up so that each um, element filled the octet, so we've got its eight um, electrons. And then that's basically our working. This is what our final um, diagram looked like, where we had our bonds represented by a straight line. So one line represents one shared pair of electrons and then our unbonded electrons um, are still represented there as well. Finally, we went on and we had a look at some chemical reactions. So we started off looking, uh, well these won't be in the same order as last year, but we looked at combustion. All right, so we have complete combustion, we have incomplete combustion, and that's just dependent on how much oxygen is present. If we've got an excess of oxygen, we get complete. If we've got limited oxygen, we get incomplete. Main difference is your product. All right, so it's both fuel plus oxygen, but in the case of complete, we'll get carbon dioxide and water. In the case of incomplete, we get carbon monoxide, we get carbon, which is um, soot, and we get water. Um, easiest way to think about these is with like a Bunsen burner. So when you get yellow flame, you've got incomplete combustion, and that's why if you heat something over it, you'll get soot on the glassware. Uh, complete combustion would be when you open up the air hole, you allow more oxygen in, and that's why you get your hotter flame and it's um, more efficient. We then had a look at neutralization reactions. So acid and base goes to salt plus water. Um, the bases had that hydroxide group. Um, acid and carbonate goes to salt plus carbon dioxide and water. We had a look at how to predict your salts as well. Um, so if you can't remember that, please go to the YouTube channel and have a look at the um, videos associated with those. We then had a look at combination reactions. So two or more reactants go to one product. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen making water is an example of that. Decomposition is the opposite. So one reactant to two or more products. Uh, this is what happens in an airbag to release the uh, nitrogen gas to fill it up. Um, we then had a look at single replacements. So that's your acid metal reactions. Again, we looked at how to predict your salts as well. And then we have a look at double replacement um, reactions. These ones are going to come up again this year, girls. So if you can't remember how to do these, please go back and have a look at the um, video associated with it. Uh, but basically, your cations and um, anion swap. So we've got this substance AB, we've got a second ionic substance CD, and your cation swap places. So we get CB and AD. An example would be um, lead nitrate and potassium iodide. Um, they would react and we would get uh, lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Okay, so they just swap um, the cations. And that is eight weeks crammed into less than 15 minutes, girls. Um, so hopefully this all rings a bell. If anything doesn't, please go back and have a look at it. Um, we will be covering over most of this in the first couple of weeks anyway. Um, but yeah, it would be handy to uh, be able to recall some of this stuff. So if you have any questions, please ask. Um, but yeah, apart from that, let's get stuck into year 11. It's going to be fun.